A.C. Thompson, a staff reporter for ProPublica and a correspondent for PBS's Frontline, covers civil rights and criminal justice issues. His stories have led to the exoneration of the wrongly accused and the prosecution of New Orleans police officers for murder. He was in Charlottesville when neo-Nazis and counter-protesters met in a bloody, deadly clash. Thompson has been reporting on the rise of white supremacy among young American men and in 2008 collaborated on a new frontline documentary called Documenting Hate, New American Nazis. AC Thompson, thank you very much for being here and being part of CrossCut Now. Thanks for having me. What would you tell a person who was brown, black, queer, Muslim, whether or not they should feel safe? In America, in today, America today, in general. In general. Yeah, I mean, I think one thing that's important, right, is not to be paranoid, not to be overwhelmed with fear, not to be constantly alarmed. I don't think you should be, I, but I think you should be vigilant. I think you should keep your eyes open. I think you should be concerned about what political leaders are saying. And I think you should be aware that we have had an uptick in sort of white racist terror attacks since 2008, since Barack Obama was president, and that has accelerated in the last two years. Is it as simple to say that it's a reaction because of Barack Obama? I mean, part of it was, is because what you saw was the white supremacist movement was reacting to first African-American president, president who was interested in gun control, president that, who was an unabashed liberal. And so that was the reaction then. What you've seen more recently is sort of um, Trump's rhetoric galvanizing and catalyzing the nativist, racist, and extreme right movements. And how do, I mean, I've heard that a lot, and, you know, that always gets challenged as to, you know, whether Trump's presidency actually is fomenting that. So what did you learn in your, in your reporting? What is the connection? Right. So that's the debate. People say, were racist movements always around before? Right. And or is Trump giving them more energy, more oxygen and making them explode? And so it's the latter. I mean, it, or it's both, really. I mean, obviously, there have always been uh, racist currents in this country. There have always been organized white supremacist groups. But in the time around the 2016 election, what you saw was a massive explosion in activity. And you saw massive growth in new groups, in new activists coming into the white power movement, which really had been basically dormant for a decade and a half before that. And these people said, we love Donald Trump. He is speaking our language. He's not perfect. He's not a full-blown racist and anti-Semite, but we really like him. And it was the first time that the white power movement had embraced a mainstream presidential candidate in decades and decades. I have met so many people that said Trump helped draw me to this movement. He was saying the things that I felt, and then I t went a step further and became more radical. I watched both documentaries, which are, are just compelling and, and also horrifying to see. What, what terrified you or what startled you the most going into the subject matter and sort of the expectations or the assumptions and then actually seeing it or, or hearing it or listening? You know, there, there's so many things that were concerning to me, are concerning to me. I mean, one of them I would say is, I think that we have this notion that people in the radical right, the racist right, are not particularly sophisticated, that they're not particularly intelligent, that they're backwoods rednecks, and that's all wrong, it's all wrong. I mean, the truth of the matter is, like the young men that I've met are from mainstream sort of America. They are very bright, they are very sophisticated, they have organizational skills that I think are remarkable. And when I was in Charlottesville, we were waiting for the torch march to start. And my colleague said, I don't even think this thing's gonna happen. There's two people here. And all of a sudden, there were hundreds of young men who descended uh, on the school from all different directions in a matter of moments. And they were able to form up and march in complete unison very, very quickly. And that spoke to a level of organization that to me is, is worrisome. Well, and then and your reporting actually led to convictions. Can you talk a little, little bit about the role of law enforcement, the, the lack of where they lack and what they should be doing? Well, there were a couple things that happened, right? And so one is that if you, if you look back in time, 1995, you had the Oklahoma City bombing, which was done by a white supremacist, Tim McVeigh. And at that time... One person. One, no, it was done by a broader group. But it was done by him, co-conspirators, and he was part of a broader movement. But he was the main architect. Okay. And if you look back at that time, 
there was a lot of interest in the federal government, in law enforcement, in the radical right. And they were following these people. They were infiltrating their groups. They were taking down their groups. And at times, frankly, they overreached and did too much and went too far. But there was a lot of intensity. There was scrutiny paid to these groups, particularly after 95 when we had this incredible terror attack in Oklahoma City. Fast forward to 2001, you have 9-11, and suddenly the gaze shifts entirely, and it all becomes about Islamic terrorism or so-called um, Islamic radicalism. <clears throat> After that, the white supremacists and the radical right, like nobody's looking at them. At the federal government, at the local level, nobody's looking at them. And the sort of people who'd been chasing those movements at the bureau sort of aged out of government. Fast forward again to 2015, and you, this movement is really growing, it's really exploding, and you have nobody at the federal level who really understands the old movement, let alone the new movement. And so I think that there was a lot of catch up that had to be done by the federal government. Um, as well, when we were looking, working on our first film, the first documenting hate film, we're looking at local law enforcement, and we just see one insane melee after another across the country right. between racist, the Klan, neo-Nazis, and their opponents. And you just say, look, I've been covering policing for more than 20 years. It's not that hard to prevent this. It is not that hard to keep people from trying to kill each other. It's basic policing, and I've seen it done many times. But during this time span, for whatever reason, police were, I think, abdicating their duties over and over again. In this world, do you think there is a role that, you know, violence begets violence? Is there a role for uh, the alt-left? Do you foresee that the only way to, um, to, 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 to sort of address this is with violence on the other end? You know, that's a great question. Um, it's, a, it's a great question. I, you know, for me, I don't think that... I don't think that's the most effective tactic at this point, and I don't think it's a particularly effective tactic. I think actually it's been more radicalizing for people in the racist right. I think sublethal violence has a tendency to radicalize people. The argument is you need to deplatform fascists and keep them from speaking in your town and having a place to organize, and I totally understand that, and, and I, can, I can relate to why people feel that sense of being threatened and a, and a sense to feel that they need to move these people out of their community. But I actually think that the most effective and most useful tactic over the last several years has been information and sunshine and sunlight on these groups. And I think that the more uh, that has been done to expose these groups, to expose the companies that are facilitating their payments online, to expose the companies that are facilitating their online presences with websites and podcasts and so forth. I think that's actually been the thing that has been crippling to the movement rather than sort of direct violent confrontation in the street. Do you think Charlottesville is, go is as worst as it, as it will be? Do you think it's gonna get worse? No, it's already gotten worse. It's already gotten worse because what happened in Charlottesville was the white supremacist movement saw themselves as the victims. And the white supremacist movement always sees itself as a victim, right? It, sa it says, look, we're white guys and we don't get to be white guys. We're being driven out of this country. We're becoming minorities in this country. Uh, the country's being overrun run by, by brown folks and Muslims and other immigrants, and we're the victims. And they saw that about themselves in Charlottesville. They said, look, we just wanted to have our peaceful rally and people were mean to us, and the anti-fascists threw stuff at us, and the cops didn't protect us. So now we're going on underground, and we're going to engage in terrorism because we can't meet openly and publicly. And that's what they've done. That, that is what happened in Pittsburgh with the Tree of Life synagogue shooting. That's what happened in San Diego just recently with the shooting at the synagogue there. That's what happened with the attempts to burn down mosques all over the country. That's what happened with the attack in New Zealand on the mosques there. So I think it's already gotten worse. And I think that turn is what we're seeing now, the next phase of the movement where it moves into militancy and violence and it organizes covertly. What happens when the country is a majority minority? Going forward in this country, I think it's gonna be harder and harder to be a bigot. I just think it is because we live in an incredibly diverse 
country. You, everyone has uh, neighbors who are people of, you know, like white folks don't always live in white enclaves anymore. They have neighbors who are immigrants. They have neighbors who are Muslims. They have neighbors who are Mexican Americans and friends and people they go to school with. So I think it becomes harder and harder to become a bigot. And I think, I think the country knits itself together and we find our commonalities. But I also think as that goes on, you will see these sort of resistance to that. And I think you will see spates of violence for a long time to come. Technology certainly um, allows you to, to, to remove yourself and to be just with like-minded people. And, and you certainly looked at the role of um, the, sort of the lone wolf, the, the, organiz the, the organizing within the extremist groups and how, um, how they're able to communicate and, and even look backwards to, uh, to people that have been a little quiet. Can, can you talk a little bit about Yeah, that? yeah. I mean, that's, like so, that's so important, I think. If you look at the 80s and 90s, it was really hard to disseminate your crazy, racist, extremist message. Like, you had to put out a, a publication and mail it to people. You had to uh, do mail order and be pen pals with people. And now you can reach millions of people instantly through the largest social media platforms in the world. And that is the thing that the racist right has really taken advantage of and has leveraged. So for me, uh, when I go on YouTube and I'm doing research on the white supremacists, I type in uh, Vanguard Streaming Network, and that's a neo-Nazi YouTube channel that has big SS logo uh, on its page and they can put out all the insane racist stuff they want to put out. And now YouTube thinks that I'm an insane racist, and so every time I go on there, they offer me 20 more suggestions for horrible white supremacist video channels. Uh, the white supremacists of today are taking advantage of technology to network, to proselytize, to share their message, and to sort of indoctrinate people. And they never had access to an audience that large before. If it's so much a... a, a worry about, worrisome about protecting the white race. Have you looked at the role of women and families and has that aspect, is that aspect growing or of concern to you? So it's so interesting, right? Because if you look at the white supremacist movements in the 80s and 90s, they had this like super patriarchal, super traditional notion of family, right? And, and they had, I would say, in some ways, great esteem for women. They wanted to protect them. They wanted them to be part of the movement. And of course, they had to be protected from all threats, but they um, revered them in many ways, and they viewed them as the future of white people. Uh, I think what you see with the white supremacist movement now is that they are incredibly misogynistic, that they hate women, that they don't want women to have anything to do with the movement, that they want to say awful things about women all the time. And so I think what you have is a move from like ultra patriarchy to ultra misogyny in the movement. And I think that extends over to, to gays, to lesbians, to trans folks as well, like a deep, deep anger at those groups. Thank you so much. I feel like I could talk to you forever. Um, thank you very much, AC Thompson, for being here. Thanks for having me.